Now, our speaker today is going to be a wonderful treat uh, as he talks about some very, very important matters with respect to education and things that uh, are important both to uh, students as well as faculty members. And so I'm thrilled by the, the wonderful attendance today. You're, you're in for a good experience. Uh, Neil J. Anderson is a professor of English language teaching and learning at Brigham Young University, Hawaii. He has taught at Ohio University, BYU, and now BYU-Hawaii. He's the author and, or a co-editor of over 50 books, book chapters, and journal articles. His research interests include second language reading, language learner strategies, learner self-assessment, motivation in language teaching and learning, and English language teacher leadership development. Professor Anderson served as president of the TESOL International Association from 2001 to 2002. He has been a Fulbright teaching and research scholar in Costa Rica and in Guatemala. Professor Anderson was the 2014 recipient of the prestigious TESOL International Association James E. Aladis Service Award. In 2016, on the 50th anniversary of the TESOL International Association, Professor Anderson was recognized as one of the 50 individuals worldwide who has made a significant contribution to the profession of teaching English to speakers of other languages. Professor Anderson loves the multilingual and multicultural environment at BYU Hawaii and the opportunity to interact with so many competent students and colleagues. Outside of his teaching and research, he is happiest when he is doing one of five things. Number one, spending time with his wife and family. Well said, Professor Anderson. Number two, running. If you haven't seen him, this is true. He runs a lot. Uh, Going to be in the St. George Marathon soon, very soon, immediately after this. <laughs> <laughs> Snorkeling, number three. Number four, reading. Or five, serving in the temple, where he serves uh, several shifts each week. Brother Anderson currently serves on the High Council of the Laie Hawaii Married Student Stake. He and his wife, Kathy, are the parents of five children, and they have 20 grandchildren. Will you please welcome Professor Anderson? So as to not disturb the mood after uh, Professor Anderson's talk, uh, I will announce now that the benediction will be offered immediately thereafter by Christina M. Akanoa, who teaches in political science. I also remind you that there is a panel discussion at 3 p.m. this afternoon to 4.30 in the Aloha Center, room 155-165. We hope that many of you will be able to join us there. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and aloha. aloha. The traditional Hawaiian greeting of aloha allows us to express to each other our love and our support. With my greeting this morning, I hope that you feel my aloha for you, members of the BYU Hawaii learning community. I love learning. I love thinking about learning. I love thinking about my thinking of learning. <laughs> I love teaching. I love thinking about teaching. I love thinking about my thinking of teaching. I love the Holy Ghost. I love thinking about how I feel when I'm influenced by the Holy Ghost. I love thinking about my thinking about how I'm influenced by the Holy Ghost when I feel it. As Brother Jurgensen mentioned in the prayer this morning, the Holy Ghost is the true teacher. And I invite each of us today to be taught by him as we gather together. Let me extend a challenge to you this morning. As we are gathering here, I invite you to th think about something new about the topic of metacognition, about the BYU-Hawaii framework for learning and teaching, and or about the synergy that is generated when the framework is purposefully connected to the metacognitive awareness that we should each be engaged in. 
My remarks this morning will focus on these three areas. Let's first consider the concept of metacognition. It has been 42 years since Flavel first introduced the concept of metacognition. According to Flavel, metacognition refers to one's knowledge concerning one's own cognitive processes and products or anything related to them. For example, I am engaging in metacognition if I notice that I'm having more trouble learning A than B, if it strikes me that I should double check C before accepting it as fact. In my own work, I define metacognition as the ability to step back from one's learning and think about the thinking that goes into making decisions in the teaching and learning process. Metacognition is the ability to make your thinking visible. It is the ability to identify what one knows and does and what one does not know and does not do. Metacognition results in critical but healthy reflection and evaluation of one's thinking, which may result in making specific changes in what you do. Metacognition is not simply thinking back on an event, describing what happened and how you felt about it. Metacognition is much deeper. When an individual is fully engaged in the metacognitive process, she is able to not only describe what she is thinking, but she is able to go deeper and explain why she is thinking it and how her thinking is influencing decisions that she will make about her teaching or learning. One well-known study illustrates the power of metacognitive engagement in the self-assessment process. A 1999 study by psychologists Justin Kruger and David Dunning empirically tests the hypothesis of learners' ability to, con to be conscious of their learning and aware of their learning. They titled their initial study, Unskilled and Unaware of It. How difficulties in recognizing one's incompetence led to inflated self-assessments. The study highlights the centrality of metacognitive skills and, and provides a rationale for why we need a strong metacognitive awareness training component in educational contexts. Kruger and Dunning indicate that when people are incompetent in the strategies they adopt to achieve success and satisfaction, they suffer a dual burden. Not only do they reach erroneous conclusions and make unfortunate choices, but their incompetence robs them of the ability to realize it. The central proposition in our argument is that incompetent individuals lack the metacognitive skills that enable them to tell how poorly they are performing. And as a result, they come to hold inflated views of their performance and ability. Kruger and Dunning tested their hypothesis in four separate studies using content from three different academic disciplines. In their first study, they tested the academic discipline of humor. In the second, logical reasoning. In the third, grammatical knowledge in English. And in the fourth, they replicated the content from the logical reasoning discipline and then added a metacognitive skills training component for half of the participants to determine if it would ameliorate their poor performance due to incompetence. In each of the four studies, they asked the university students to perform a task in the content domain. They then asked the students to compare themselves against their peers and to to determine in which percentile their performance on the discipline-specific test would place them. They were also asked to estimate what their final test score would be. 
For example, in the discipline of the English grammatical knowledge test, 84 students from Cornell University were asked to take a 20 item test of grammatical knowledge of American standard written English. The, each item on the test contained an underlined portion and the students were asked to determine whether the underlined portion was correct or should be replaced with one of the options provided on the test. After completing the grammatical knowledge test, students were asked to estimate their percentile rank compared with their peers. They were also asked to identify how many of the 20 test items they believed that they had answered correctly. The results of the grammatical knowledge test are consistent and similar to the results of the other content domains. The students whose performance placed them in the bottom quartile of the test grossly overestimated their ability on the test when comparing themselves against their peers. On average, they predicted that their performance on the test would place them in the 67th percentile, where their actual performance placed them in the 10th percentile. They were also um, they also significantly overestimated their score on the test. The average of the predicted score for the students in the bottom quartile on the 20 item test was 12.9. The average actual score was 9.2. At the other end of the spectrum in the Kruger and Dunning study, students were asked, students who scored in the top quartile significantly underestimated their performance. They scored better on the assessments than they believed that they would. I replicated the Kruger and Dunning study with English language learners in Costa Rica while there on a Fulbright teaching and research scholarship. I gathered data from 999 learners of English as a foreign language from 13 different language levels. Students participated in their course-specific final exams, which tested their ability in the language skills of listening, reading, and writing. As in the Kruger and Dunning study, following the exam, the students were asked to rate their perceived performance on the test in comparison with their peers, and to estimate in which percentile they felt they would fall. They then reviewed their test responses one item at a time to determine whether they believed that they had answered the question correctly or not. In addition to the written assessment of their language abilities, students also participated in an oral language interview with their teacher. Following the oral interview, they were asked to use the same rubric that the teachers had used to evaluate them in the interview and to provide a self-assessment of their oral language skills. The results for the English language learners in Costa Rica were similar to the results found in Kruger and Dunning studies. Students in the bottom quartile significantly overestimated their performance, while students in the top quartile significantly underestimated their performance. The ability to engage in critical and healthy self-assessment involves at least two factors. First, it involves closing the gap between one's perceived knowledge and one's actual knowledge of the content within the specific discipline. That is the rationale for an institution of higher learning. As faculty, our role is to provide opportunities for students in our classes to gain new knowledge in each of the distinct academic disciplines. Teaching the content knowledge in accounting, biology, economics, entrepreneurship, sports medicine, or teaching English to speakers of other languages is why we are here on this campus. Each academic discipline has a distinct body of knowledge that students need to master in order to become competent professionals within that academic discipline. 
The second factor needed to successfully engage in critical and healthy self-assessment centers on the development of metacognition. As our students are developing new content knowledge, we also want them to be able to step back from their learning and identify how their developing knowledge is consistent with the knowledge of experts within the discipline. We want them to identify what is working for them and what is not working for them. We want them to be able to identify what they are doing outside of the classroom while reading and engaging with the discipline content to prepare for coming to class to engage with the discipline content. We want our students to prepare with a purpose prior to coming to class so that they can engage enthusiastically with the new content in order to close the gap between their perceived knowledge and their actual knowledge of the content. We want them to improve incrementally each day so that by the end of the semester, they can step back from the daily learning process and clearly identify how they have increased in their learning and how they will use their learning to take the next steps the following semester to move towards accomplishing their academic training. This entire process is metacognition. Let us now consider the BYU-Hawaii framework for learning and teaching. The framework consists of three processes, prepare, engage, and improve, and seven characteristics of successful learners. Successful learners are faithful, hopeful, charitable, diligent, reflective, humble, and honest. There are 21 possible combinations that we can examine among the processes and the characteristics. We can prepare faithfully, prepare hopefully, prepare charitably, prepare diligently, prepare reflectively, prepare humbly, and prepare honestly. We can also use the seven characteristics during the processes of engaging and improving. Prepare with is the first process in the framework. I believe that at the core of preparation is understanding the purpose of the preparation. As students are preparing to read the assigned chapters before coming to our classes, they need to prepare with a purpose. I tell my students that their purpose cannot be because I have assigned the chapter to be read. They are not taking responsibility for their learning by saying that their purpose is to read because it's an assignment. They need to preview the chapter, ask themselves questions about what they already know about the content, and determine what they want to learn while engaging in the chapter and preparing for class. As faculty, as we prepare to teach our classes, we need to set clearly articulated purposes for what we want the students to be able to do after leaving class that they cannot yet do with their discipline content. We want to design class learning outcomes that allow us to close the gap between students' perceived knowledge in the discipline and their actual knowledge of the content. The Center for Learning and Teaching, in collaboration with Taylor Steele, the production and broadcast manager on campus, and his competent crew, have produced a series of videos to highlight how students are in integrating the three processes of the framework for learning and teaching, and the seven characteristics of effective learning. We will soon have the opportunity of viewing these video clips prior to each devotional as we are gathering at the CAC on Tuesday morning. Let's watch a video clip as Mark Ayo, a dual political science and TESOL major, explains the integration of the process of preparation with the learning characteristic of diligence. <laughs>
preparing diligently is being energetic, persistent, and consistent in your preparations, meaning coming to class having read all the readings, prepared for the discussions, and you're ready to face all the possible difficulties you might face for that class. Notice how Mark highlights the importance of preparing diligently by reading the material and being prepared to engage in the class discussion. After preparing with a purpose, students are ready to engage enthusiastically during class. Engaging enthusiastically includes, among other things, the ability to be focused like a laser on being engaged. When students engage enthusiastically, they are mindful of eliminating all distractions during the engagement. My personal philosophy for learning and teaching is that if I ask the students to prepare by reading prior to coming to class, and I prepare some meaningful activities for them to engage in during class that allows them to meaningfully use their new knowledge they are developing from the readings, then class can be much more engaging. Let me also share with you an element of my personal philosophy of teaching that illustrates what engagement is not. Several years ago, I asked my wife to make this drawing. The perfect class. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every student in every class looked and thought exactly like me? Now in your classes, they've got to look like me. <laughs> and they would be eager to sit and come to class each session and listen to me profess all of my great knowledge. After all, I am the professor, right? This is a perfect example of what engagement does not look like. Here are photos from a recent TESOL 310 class that more closely illustrate appropriate engagement. As professors, we should not be satisfied with a cl class that consists of a lecture and students sitting obediently writing down everything that we say or taking photos of the PowerPoint slides. We want them to be engaged with the discipline content from the textbook before arriving to class and then have meaningful opportunities to engage enthusiastically with their developing knowledge in productive ways during class. Now, let's listen as Abigail White, a TESOL major, explains how engaging reflectively influences her learning. Engaging reflectively in learning would mean actively processing what the other students are saying in my classes, what the teacher is saying in my classes, and thinking about how I can apply this information to my life and future career. Notice how Abby highlights the importance of listening to both the teacher and other learners in the classroom to engage with the material reflectively in preparation for her future career. The final process in the framework is improvement. Students and faculty need to see improvement in learning and teaching. At the end of a class session, we need to take opportunities to examine the learning outcomes for the session and have concrete evidence to indicate whether we have accomplished the outcomes for that individual class session. Having students engage in a brief writing task prior to leaving class often provides evidence of the learning for that day's outcomes. One technique that I often use to assess daily learning is a three, two, one summary. I ask students to tell me three things that they learned from the reading that they did prior to class and or the in-class discussion. I ask for two questions they are thinking about based on the content of the reading and the class discussion. 
I also ask them to identify one thing they will remember about the class session long after they have graduated from BYU-Hawaii that will influence their teaching of English to speakers of other languages. Student responses to a 3 to one summary provide me with concrete evidence of student learning for a single class session. The data informs how I will prepare for the next class session. The ultimate goal is to have evidence that incremental improvements are being made in learning. Now listen as Wesley Sorensen, a recent graduate in information technology, explains how he needs to be honest in his self-assessment of the improvement he is making in his learning. To improve honestly, to me, means to take a good look at yourself, to reflect upon what you have done, the good and the bad, and being honest with yourself, was this your best? Because if you're not honest with yourself, then who else are you going to be honest to? Being honest with yourself means not making any excuses. What I like about Wesley's video is his emphasis on being honest with himself. Honest evaluation of one's improvement will lead to closing the gap between one's perceived knowledge and one's actual knowledge in the discipline content. I believe that the real power of significant learning and teaching comes in the synergistic interactions that occur when the framework for learning and teaching is purposefully connected with metacognitive engagement. The synergy results as we begin to live the framework and not let, merely view it as a way to accomplish or approach learning and teaching. One of the insights I have gained as I have lived the framework is its dynamic nature. We can view each of the processes dynamically interacting with each process itself. For example, when involved in the preparation process, there is a mini cycle of prepare, engage, improve. We need to purposefully prepare to prepare. We need to be engaged enthusiastically in preparing. We need to improve incrementally in our preparation. That same mini cycle occurs while in the engagement process. We need to purposefully prepare for engagement. We need to be engaged enthusiastically in our engagement and we need to improve incrementally in our engagement. Likewise, the mini cycle occurs when we are in the improvement process. Do we see the synergetic interactions that occur here? I would like to thank Rob McConnell from Visual Arts for creating the dynamic visual to represent my thinking. When you add to the synergy of the interactions of the three processes with the seven characteristics of effective learners and allow the metacognitive process to occur, you have an even more powerful model for enhancing performance. Allow me to share three examples of how I live the framework and capitalize on the synergy among the three processes and the seven characteristics of the framework through critical but healthy engagement in metacognition. My first example draws upon my morning devotional. The second example relates to my preparation for the upcoming St. George Marathon. Finally, I will share how the synergy impacts teaching on campus. My most effective morning devotionals consist of preparing for meaningful scripture study. I begin with a kneeling prayer to invite the Holy Ghost to be with me. I tell Heavenly Father what I'm going to read that morning and what my purpose is. I ask for help in avoiding distractions <clears throat> like reading email or viewing um, 
updates from our children and grandchildren on Instagram. As I end the prayer, I pause to humbly listen to the Holy Ghost and ask myself if I'm ready to engage. As I engage enthusiastically in my study and pondering, I often begin by reciting the living Christ. The testimony of the apostles. One of the goals in the married student stake is to memorize this important document. I have found that by beginning my reciting by beginning my study, by reciting the words of the document, my study is anchored on the living Christ. It allows me to be more faithful in my commitment to recite from memory that important document. <laughs> A year ago, during the October 2017 General Conference, as I learned how both President Nelson and President Eyring had responded to President Monson's invitation to study and ponder the Book of Mormon daily, I realized that I had not fully accepted the prophet's invitation in his April 2017 address. Although I had been reading the Book of Mormon daily, I was not the recipient of the blessings that President Monson promised because I had not shifted my thinking to a higher level of engagement during my study. I repented for not having responded to the prophet's invitation six months earlier. I then spent the next eight months carefully studying the doctrine of Christ as found in the Book of Mormon. I recorded in a study journal the references to faith, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. After eight months of diligent daily study, I summarized in my study journal what I had learned about the doctrine of Christ and how I wanted the doctrine to be reflected in what I do. My honest reflection on what I had learned allowed me to feel the Holy Ghost as a reward for my diligence. I am currently studying how the Godhead teaches us so that I can be a more effective learner. As I have prepared with a purpose, engaged enthusiastically, and improved incrementally, my morning devotionals have become times of reflective revelation for me. The synergistic interactions of the framework have allowed me to increase my capacity to learn from the scriptures and the words of living apostles and prophets. In eight days, 19 hours, and 13, 12, 11, 10, 9 seconds, I will be at the starting line of the St. George Marathon. This will be my 10th marathon overall and the fourth time that I've run the St. George Marathon. I'm not just running another marathon. My goal is to qualify for the 2020 Boston Marathon. If I achieve the goal, this will be my second Boston Marathon. To qualify for the Boston Marathon, I need to finish the St. George Marathon in three hours and 55 minutes. That equates to an average pace of 8.58 per mile. I hope to finish at least 15 minutes faster than this by running an average of 8.24 per mile. I share that information because in setting the goal, it is essential that I know what I want the outcome to be. Training for a marathon is more involved than simply running. Every run has a purpose. There are half mile speed workouts, there are hill repeats, there are long runs, there are recovery runs. Every night before going to bed, I check to see what is on the training schedule for the next morning so I can verify the purpose of the run. While I am running, I engage enthusiastically with the run. I stay focused on the purpose of the run. I listen carefully to my body. I rarely get great ideas during a run because I'm so focused on the running itself that no additional thoughts come. I evaluate 
and engage in evaluating my improvement in running at multiple points in time. I evaluate while I'm running. I use the metrics provided by my Apple Watch to gauge an increase in speed. After a half mile speed workout, I determine what I need to do in the next half mile in order to run even faster. At the end of each week, I record all of the data from the Apple Watch into my running journal and make comparisons to the work that I accomplished in previous weeks. The cycle of prepare, engage, and improve has progressed from day to day to weeks to months of training. I'm now ready to engage with the event itself. Now let's consider how we live the framework in the classroom. Teaching in the classroom is the natural environment to live the framework. In a recent faculty observation of Esprit Sassier, who is teaching the biology 376 genetics class this semester, Mark Wolfersberger and I observed a very powerful way that Esprit begins her classes. Before students begin the class with prayer, Esprit asks the students to be specific about what is being prayed for. On one specific day, we observed, she suggested that the students pray for focus, clarity, and the ability to be organized in their discussion that day. The prayer had a powerful impact on both me and Mark. We discussed this with Esprit in the observation debriefing following the class. As we brainstormed together, Mark had a fantastic idea. He suggested that before the opening prayer is offered, we could share with the students the specific learning outcomes for the day. Then the students serving as voice for the prayer could be focused in asking Heavenly Father's blessings that the class achieve the outcomes. I used the idea that afternoon in my TESOL 310 class, and we have been doing it consistently since. Last week in class, as we followed this process and ended the opening prayer, I engaged the students in a reflection activity. We completed an everybody writes activity to reflect on whether the practice of focusing on the class learning outcomes prior to the prayer and then asking Heavenly Father for assistance in accomplishing the outcomes has had an impact on learning during class. Chelsea Smith wrote, I think these prayers have helped to bring the spirit and expand my mind to learning. There are some things in class that I was able to better understand as I thought about it and discussed it during class. And that spiritual learning has continued for me as I read the textbook and write and as I'm thinking of ways to use the knowledge to become a better teacher. Metacognition is a topic that I find interesting and exciting. I love thinking about ways that I can help myself, my students, and colleagues on campus to become more metacognitively aware of what happens in the classroom. I want all of us to live the framework and to be able to step back from our living of the framework to explain to others why we are thinking or engaging in the specific activities that we are doing in learning and teaching. I would like to invite you to the panel discussion this afternoon at 3 in Aloha Center 155-165. I have strategically selected four panelists to participate and share what the framework looks like in their classes and how they are living it. Mark Ayo, a political science and TESOL double major, who we saw in the first video clip earlier, is the student member of the panel. Aloha Lani Hausman from Hawaiian Studies, Vic Kafusi from Social Work, and Ann Springer, a special instructor in the School of Business, will join me for the panel discussion this afternoon. I hope that you can join us. As we started the discussion this morning, I extended a challenge to you to allow the Holy Ghost to teach you something new about metacognition, 
about the BYU-Hawaii framework for learning and teaching and or about the synergy that is generated when the framework is purposefully connected with metacognitive engagement. I challenge you to have a brief conversation with someone as you leave the McKay Auditorium this morning and return to your office, your classrooms, the hallways, or to work on campus or at the PCC. What did you learn today that will influence specific changes that you will want to make and how you approach your learning and teaching? Let us be more metacognitively engaged with each other and improve in ways that increase our content knowledge in our respective disciplines. Mahalo. <laughs>